So yesterday was September the 11th, and many people remembered what they were doing uh, in 2001 when two planes crashed into the twin towers of the World Trade Center, and one crashed into the Pentagon, and one was brought down in a Pennsylvanian field by uh, the passengers of the plane who bravely fought back against the hijackers. Of course, like I'm sure most of you can remember, if you're old enough, you can remember what you were doing that day when that happened, and I can as well. I was in um, my first semester at seminary at Emory University, and, um, but what I remember better, what is a better memory for me, a more hopeful memory for me, was that evening, that Tuesday evening, we went to a worship service at North Point Community Church in Alpharetta. We would go take our youth group to that service every Tuesday. And we did that day as well. And I remember we were uh, worshiping and we were pouring out our lamentations for the death and destruction that had been caused by the evil. And we were praying for our country. And it was just a time when it was... It was um, it was a painful time, but also a time when we were finding hope in our faith and our relationship with God when we needed it. And, and I remember that right there in that service, I was struck because President Bush uh, gave a national address on television. You may remember that. And so during the service, they stopped in the middle of the service and on the screens, they put the president up. And I thought it was, it was um, quite moving to have the president speaking to the whole nation and to us while we were gathered in worship. And I remember how he quoted from Psalm 23 and how he um, obviously had was calling upon his own faith in God, seeking uh, to fortify his resolve and leading through the nation through a crisis right in the midst of it. And um, I remember during that time that while the terrorists had sought to destroy America, their evil act had united us. And we had set aside, um, at least for a few days or a few weeks, maybe a few months, we had set aside much of our differences. And it just seemed like we were, we, we didn't care about that so much as we cared about coming together and um, holding each other together. 20 years later, we are under attack from a different kind of enemy, a virus that's so small you cannot even see it. And what's more, we've been under attack now for more than a year and a half. People are weary, they're tired. We just want our world to go back to normal. We don't want to have to wear these stupid masks, and we want to be able to hug each other without having to think about whether we're going to kill each other by doing it. But unfortunately, normal seems like it's a long way off. As I said earlier, right now at this moment, they're conducting a funeral at Salem Baptist Church for Rodney Lee, beloved PE teacher from Varnell Elementary. It is clear that we have not returned to normal yet. And will we ever turn to normal? return to normal? I don't know. God hasn't shared that revelation with me. However, God has reminded me that what the world needs now, more than anything else, is love. Whether we find ourselves attacked from uh, being attacked by terrorists or by a virus, love is the answer. Some may think that that's just the kind of thing a preacher would say. <laughs> Talking about love, what an empty cliché. But I don't want you to mistake my statement for some frou-frou, pie-in-the-sky religious nonsense. The love of which I speak is not an empty, worldly platitude. The love of God described in the Bible is as deep as the ocean and more powerful than an atomic bomb. It not only changes people, it changes generations. And it alters empires. The biblical love, God's love, is not the same as the love that the world offers and that we so much talk about, 
Jesus. We, we just throw that word around so casually. God's love was demonstrated when Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And not because we deserved it, but because we needed it. And we needed God's grace and his forgiveness. And we found that in Christ on the cross. And so Jesus, God's only son who was perfect in every way, atoned for our sin. Jesus died in our place to pay the price for our sin, even though he was totally innocent. In Christ, we see the picture of real love. For as he said in John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. But we also saw that Jesus not only laid down his life for his friends, but he even laid down his life for his enemies, for the ones who nailed him to the cross. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 through 7, defines the kind of love Christ demonstrates, the kind of love that changes people and generations and empires. It's the kind of love the world needs now and that Christians are called to give at all times and to all people. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. And today I want to focus on only the second element of divine love. Last week we learned that love was patient. Today we learned that love is kind. Kindness is being friendly, generous, considerate. And it's really not hard to understand kindness. It's a pretty simple thing. Even a child understands kindness. The challenge with kindness is doing it. And doing it to all people, even when they are unkind to you. We get so wrapped up in ourselves sometimes that it's hard to turn our gaze outward, away from ourselves to others who are in need of kindness. When we struggle to meet, when we are struggling to meet our own needs, who has the energy to be kind to someone else? And what I've found, but yet what I've found in my life is that even when I am empty, even when I'm worn down, when I'm kind to someone else, it somehow picks me up. Rather than depleting me further, it fills me up. This is a mystery. Jesus was kind. In his day, like in our own, they practiced strict social distancing. Did you know that? In particular, you were not to come near anyone who was unclean. Now, while they weren't worried about COVID-19, in the first century, there were many things they believed would make a person unclean. The most obvious was leprosy. Leprosy is a contagious skin disease that causes severe, disfiguring skin sores and nerve damage in the arms, legs, and skin areas around your body. Lepers were required to live apart from the rest of society so as not to spread their disease to others. While in quarantine, they couldn't work normal jobs. They couldn't go to worship. They couldn't even visit with their family and friends because that would make their family and friends unclean too. And they would have to quarantine for seven days, according to Leviticus, even if they didn't get sick. Of course, being that Jesus lived in the first century, a time with little understanding about how to properly diagnose one disease from another, any skin disorder could be misunderstood and mislabeled as leprosy. I heard it said once that even a teenager with severe acne could be labeled as a leper in the first century. People were irrationally afraid of leprosy because it was a social stigma as well as a legitimate health risk, and it was something that they didn't understand. 
Of course, being that uh, Jesus was Jesus, he didn't always follow the rules that society had set out. In Luke chapter 5, verse 12, it tells us, In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. Notice it says this was an advanced case of leprosy. So this wasn't a teenager who had some acne. This was a clear case. And it says, When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Here was a leper who was required by law to stay away from people. He was supposed to stand off at a distance, and whenever people came around, he was to yell out a warning, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. So not only did he have to stay away from people, he had to degrade himself, humiliate himself, by calling it out and broadcasting it to the whole world. But this leper had already committed a social taboo by approaching Jesus. He was desperate. He begs Jesus to heal him. And Jesus loves him and is kind. In verse 13 it says, Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing, he said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Jesus was the son of God imbued with miraculous power to be able to heal things like this that not even the doctors of the time could heal. But we might also think because he was the Son of God and he was so powerful, we might think it was easier for him to put his health on the line by reaching out in kindness to touch a, and heal a leper. Surely God would not let his only begotten son be infected by leprosy because of an act of kindness. Of course, it wasn't, we, we, we know that it wasn't that Jesus was just trying to avoid risk and that he... he He was not vulnerable himself. Read the rest of the story, and you see how Jesus laid down his life, lost his life on the cross for the sake of humanity. But what about his followers? Are we supposed to show similar acts of kindness, even if it risks our own health? To be sure, Christ doesn't wish Christians to be cavalier with their life and their health. I believe Jesus would encourage Americans today to take proper precautions to limit the spread of COVID-19. It is an act of kindness in and of itself to the community to wear a mask, to take a vaccine, to limit physical contact with others. However, Jesus is also clear with his followers that they are to be willing to suffer and even risk their lives for the sake of the kingdom. He didn't say they're to suffer and risk their life for the sake of their personal freedoms or for a political party or for any of those other things, but for the sake of the kingdom. For Jesus said, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Matthew 10, 39. Early Christians in the first century understood this and lived it. They showed incredible loving kindness in the face of plagues that were far deadlier than COVID-19. The Antonine Plague during the second century killed one-third of the population of the Roman Empire. One-third. It is said that 25% of the people who contracted that plague died. They believe it was probably smallpox or measles. And, of course, they didn't have anything to really treat it. So 25% of the people who got that died. That's compared to COVID, which I think is less than 1%, but still deadly. Obviously, non-Christian Romans were so scared that they fled the cities. When the plague would come, they would flee from the city, which merely spread the pandemic further because it would go with them to the next city. 
and infect the people there. Pagans, who didn't have any of the ideas that we take for granted in the 21st century America, after, 20, uh, after 2,000 years of Christian ideals being drilled into us, they didn't have that, and so they simply abandoned their debt, their people that were sick to die. They either left them alone in the house when they went somewhere else, or they would kick them out of the house into the street, and they would die exposed out in the street. They did that while the earliest Christians would stay and tend to the sick and dying, knowing full well that it would likely result in their own deaths. They showed works of unreasonable sacrifice, mercy, that simply dumbfounded the pagans that were their neighbors. In Rome, the Christians buried not only their own, but also the pagans who died without funds for proper burial. They also supplied food for thousands of people on a daily basis because society was breaking down and all of those things were falling apart. And the Christians, instead of saying, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Run to the hills and let's, uh, you know, get off by ourselves. No, they said, what can we do to help our community? Even though last year, our community was trying to kill us. Now they're saying, what can we do to help? In another plague in the 4th century, the emperor Julian, who was not a Christian, said to his pagan priest, y'all need to act more like the Christian, the Christians. You need to show love and kindness. Christians' loving kindness during the darkest plagues of disease and death during the Roman era changed society so much with, that the Roman Empire eventually itself adopted Christianity as their religion. Because so many people had seen that the Christian loving kindness was authentic, was willing to put its life on the line for the sake of others who didn't even care about them. And that changed people's hearts that and other things. And Christian ideas about forgiveness and love and kindness and sacrificial service changed Rome. And it changed the whole world. 2,000 years of Christian influence teaching people to love to the point of putting your own life on the line for the sake of others has left an indelible mark on our world. Even among non-Christians. It is Christian core values that led firefighters and responders to rush towards the Twin Towers on September 11th, putting their own lives at risk for the sake of others. Whether or not they were Christian, whether or not they were even conscious of it, their bravery and their self-sacrifice traces roots back through the centuries to those early Christians and to Jesus himself who died on the cross for the sake of the world, who desperately needed his love, even though it didn't deserve it. Now, people today, even that are not Christians, will say, well, that's just the way people are. No, that's not the way people are. People are that way now because we've had 2,000 years of Christian teaching telling us that that's the way we're supposed to be. But that is not the way people are naturally. It's not the way people were for most of the history of the world before Christ. If you are a follower of Christ, you are called to love one another and to exhibit Christ's love to the world, even your enemies. Last week we learned Christian love is patient. Today I tell you love is kind. When I think of our world today, of how mean-spirited we are with one another and how we are so quick to condemn and to argue and to accuse and to think the worst of each other and to call each other names and to belittle one another, it breaks my heart. We are tearing each other apart. 
we are destroying ourselves in ways the 9-11 terrorists never could. And self-professed Christians are sometimes the worst. We must repent and do better. We must follow Christ. As we close today, I want to challenge you to be more kind this week. Make a commitment to be kind. Start each day with a prayer that God would help you be kind. The type of kindness real love requires is something beyond human capability. It must be empowered by God's Holy Spirit. So choose today to follow Christ. Follow Him as Lord, that you may be saved, that you may be filled with His love. What are some practical things you could do to be kind this week? Could you write a note to someone? Could you... Pray for someone and and ask the Lord to help them and then pray that God would show you what you could do to be kind to them. Maybe while you're out eating at a restaurant, you might pay for somebody's meal. Or while you're at the grocery store, you could offer to return someone else's grocery cart. Or don't take the closest parking spot in the parking lot. If you're like me, you probably need the extra steps anyway. Sponsor someone to receive an Operation Mercy Drops grant because you know someone that needs some help. And the church has some resources that can help them, but we don't know who the people are that that need it. And you're the missing link. You're the one who knows them and comes to the church and says, hey, can we help this person? You could take uh, some treats to a local fire station, do something to help the people at the hospital. Use your social media to be kind to others instead of posting a funny, jabby, political meme about how everybody else is stupid and we're smart. Do something that's kind and encouraging and showing love. And be kind to yourself. Sometimes we're we're our own harshest critics. So learn to give yourself a break sometimes. Cut yourself some slacks. Not some slacks. (laughs) Maybe you need some slacks. Go to the store and get them instead. What's something that you could do this week? Let's reflect on that for a minute before we close. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and being kind and patient with us. Help us also to follow your example in Christ and do the same for others by the power of your Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ we ask. Amen. Mm -hmm.